Welcome to the People's Church. Uh, my name is Pastor Ken Morris. I'm the pastor of care and outreach here. And so, again, thank you for coming. Um, I, I know there's there's some kids coming from Franktown. I just I saw one of their leaders. And when we were talking, he said this was real timely because they had a young man who had been in their program and uh, just three weeks ago he committed suicide. So we, we, I think everyone here knows this is real and it's something that we need to keep talking about. And so I'm, I'm glad to see you guys here. You know, in the, in the scriptures, it talks about uh, peace and the, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. And interesting uh, definitions around that word that it's, it's not just a calmness which we often associate with peace, but uh, also packed into that, that, that Hebrew idea of, of shalom is health and wholeness. And I think that's, that's a lot of what this night's about, is, is helping young people uh, find peace. And, and, and that, in that peace, there's health, there's wholeness, there's there's meaning and purpose for their lives that make them want to continue and discover all that God has for them. So what I would like to do is just to open us with a prayer, and then I'll make an introduction. Our God, you're the giver of life. And you have revealed that for each person, they are created with a purpose and a hope. And you have plans for them. So God, uh, we ask that as we listen and learn and uh, leave this room uh, better equipped, that you will help us uh, in encounters that we would have with those who who have no hope, who see little reason to continue living, that God, somehow you give us the grace, the ability to communicate truth that will transform, that will help them re-engage and find hope. And again, Lord, we thank you for life, for all that that life means, for the promise of eternal life. And so, Lord, and for those uh, who are here uh, with uh, with sadness, who have lost loved ones, God, we thank you that you are God of comfort. You're a God who redeems and who can take any situation and, and bring something positive, something good out of it and, and, and give us, return us to hope from despair. So God, use uh, these speakers to bring life, to bring hope this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now I'd like to introduce, uh, where'd she go? There she is, Chief uh, Deborah Faulkner, uh, Chief of our Franklin Police Department. If, if you would come, Chief, now and speak to us. Good evening. Um, I'd like to recognize the members of the Franklin Police Department that are here. Would you raise your hand so they can see you in case they don't necessarily speak to me, but they seek you out in the, in the hallways or someplace and ask you questions. Please, those of you here, please feel free to do that. I am honored to be here tonight to talk about this topic, which is so important to all of us who are members of the city of Franklin and in and around Middle Tennessee. It is such an important topic, but it's also a tough subject to talk about but there are things that we can do 
to make a difference in the lives of our children. I've only been at the Franklin Police Department for about eight months, but one of the first things that I noticed was an amazing number of calls that my officers receive that are suicide or suicide attempts. I see them in my reports daily and weekly. And to just give you uh, insight into that, in January of this year, we had four in one day. The total for the month of January was 10 attempts and unfortunately, one actual suicide. In February, we had four attempts and in March, we had three. In Tennessee, for the year 2013, if we look at the numbers regarding suicide deaths for ages 10 years old to 19 years old, there are some very interesting numbers that I'd like to share with you. I don't want to overwhelm you with a lot of numbers, but these really jumped out at me. <clears throat> In Tennessee, if you look at the Suicide Prevention Network, the number of deaths for ages 10 years to 19 years for the year 2013, that's the last year that we have totals. For the total of Tennessee, there were 40, 48 in that age group. Now, if I look at Davidson County, which has a population of about 626,000 people, they had six suicides in that age group, young people. If you look at Chattanooga, Hamilton County, they had one. Knox County had two. In Jackson, they had zero. Murray County, they had zero. I'm trying to pick out counties that are close to us. But also, Rutherford County had zero. Shelby County, and we know they have close to a million people in and around that area. They had five suicides in the age group between 10, 10 years old and 19 years old. Williamson County had four. We're almost up there with Shelby County and Davidson County, and we only have about 68,000 people. That, to me, that was amazing. And here are some, just a few examples of calls for service in Franklin that my officers have already answered the first quarter of this year. And what I'm reading to you is just the couple of two-liners that we get in our messages on our telephone. Barricaded subject. A call regarding an autistic child barricaded with a knife to his neck. Entry was made and the subject was taken to Williamson Medical Center. We had an officer injured on that call. 19-year-old bipolar threatened to kill himself with a knife. Then he went after his mother and his father. The father got the knife. Officers arrived and he was taken to Williamson Medical Center. The police department and the fire department responded to an attempted suicide by a 14-year-old female who ingested cold medicine. She was transferred and transported to the Williamson Medical Center. And finally, the police department and the fire department responded to a report of a 19-year-old who was missing and an endangered female. She may be upset, wearing only her pajamas, and it was cold outside. Facebook indicates she may be with friends for the night. Officers located her at the 4th Avenue parking garage. Officers responded to a call for a missing 17-year-old female. The female is known to be a runaway and is on medications for depression and has a history of self-harm. These are our children here in Franklin. And as a police chief, this gets my attention. We are blessed in so many ways, I don't have to tell you, our economy, our schools, our neighborhoods, our low, crime, our low crime rate, and our quality of life. We have the best of everything, and yet people are trying to take their own life. Police officers, you know, are trained to be good observers regarding negative or deviant behavior. But unfortunately, in these situations, we have no interaction until the worst has happened. These are our children and our future, and I'm sworn to protect them. 
and I am also concerned as you are. Now being a native Nashvillian and a Franklin transplant, I have followed the music industry all my life. And I may be one of the few people that listens to the words, to the songs. But there was a song written in Nashville in 2004 about a true story. One of the songwriters got a call from his teenage daughter while she was at school. She was very upset. She advised him her best friend's boyfriend had taken his life. Like all good songwriters, life touches their heart and they write a song about it. This song is called, How Do You Get That Lonely? It was recorded by Blaine Larson, his album, In My High School Years. And it reached 18 on the Billboard Hot 100 so it must have resonated with a lot of people across the country and probably across the world. It was written about an 18-year-old named Lance Emmett. He lived with his parents, guess where, in Mount Pleasant, Tennessee. So close, right at Mount Pleasant. Let me just read you some of the lyrics of this song because it really jumps out at me. And it has a beautiful melody. If you go on YouTube, there's a video out there. If you, you've seen it or heard it, it's really beautiful. It was just another story written on a second page underneath the Tigers football score. It said, he was only 18, a boy about my age. They found him face down in the bedroom floor. There'll be services on Friday at Lawrence Funeral Home. Then out on Mooresville Highway, they'll lay him neath the stone and the courses how do you get that lonely? How do you hurt that bad? To make you make the call that having no life at all is better than the life that you had. How do you feel so empty? You want to let it go. How do you get that lonely? And nobody know. Did his girlfriend break up with him? Did he buy a gun or steal it? Did he lose a fight with drugs or alcohol? Did his mom and dad forget to say, I love you, son? Did no one see the writing on the wall? I'm not blaming anybody, but I'll do the best we can. I know hindsight's 2020, but I still don't understand. How do you get that lonely? How do you hurt that bad? To make you make the call that having no life at all is better than the life you had. How do you feel so empty? You want to let it all go. How do you get that lonely and nobody know? It was just another story printed on the second page underneath the Tigers football score. And in Mount Pleasant, the high school there, they're called the Tigers. Now I know young people feel a lot of stress and pressure and they are going through so much. But I'm here and so are you to break the silence about suicide and keep our children healthy, happy, supported by the entire community, and more importantly, to feel safe. Now, I'd like to introduce um, an outstanding member of our community, someone that we all know and, and respect, not only personally, but professionally. She's a fine woman, and she cares deeply, not only about our justice system, but about our children. And that's Juvenile Court Judge Sharon Guppy. Good evening, and thank you all so much for coming. We, um, in juvenile court, a, a couple months ago, we had the honor of having the Jason Foundation come and speak to our staff because um, I was concerned about this issue and wanted to educate our staff, and, um, and we were so impressed and moved with their presentation that we wanted to share it with our community. <coughs> We, um, in, in our juvenile court here in Williamson County, we want to be a resource for you parents in raising your children and helping you raise your children because that's what we do is, is protect our, our children. And it's, a, it's an important function uh, for me, for our juvenile court to partner with our police and our church. And we thank uh, the People's Church so much for, uh, for offering their, their venue for us for this presentation. 
Um, I'm, I'm going to introduce the members of the Jason Foundation in just a minute, but I wanted to take a moment to to introduce my staff. Um, we've, we've had some people that have worked really hard on this with Charlie Warner at the police department, and, and I'm going to ask uh, Zanny Martin, our new director of juvenile court, to stand up, please. our new assistant director of juvenile court to stand as well. And Tim Tranberg is our probation officer and he was very instrumental in putting all this together and we thank you very much as well, Tim. So, uh, tonight we're going to have the pleasure of hearing from two people. Uh, one is uh, Senior Judge Paul Summers and um, if I I really don't have enough time to tell you all the jobs that Judge Summers has had, but I'll go through it pretty quickly. He was the district attorney for the 25th Judicial District. He was a previous uh, judge on the Court of Criminal Appeals. He was also our state attorney general. He is uh, now, as I said, a retired senior judge. He travels the state of Tennessee, filling in for some of our uh, circuit uh, and chancery court judges. Um, he is also a retired colonel from the uh, U.S. Army, one of our veterans, and so we're very honored to have him tonight uh, as part of our presentation. Uh, Carl Flatt is also with us. We're very, um, very pleased that the president and founder of the Jason Foundation is here himself to, to speak with you all. And the Jason Foundation is uh, one of the nation's leading nonprofit organizations um, that addresses the issue of the topic of suicide on a national level. So uh, I welcome both of them and we'll turn it over to Judge Summers. Thank you. First of all, Clark Flatt, the president of the Jason Foundation, and I are pleased to be here tonight. I had the opportunity to speak at the Justice Complex about two and a half months ago that Judge Guffey referred to, and at that time one of our directors at the Jason Foundation, Morgan Marks, and I made the presentation, and I told Judge Guffey that this time I brought my A-team because I assure you that after you hear from Clark Flatt, that you will know what I'm talking about in 18. The topic that we have tonight, first of all, we were given an hour and a half. I want to make you feel a little bit better. I've made many, many public speeches in my lifetime. I've also developed a sense of humor and I can laugh at myself and I know that people don't like long speeches. Uh, my idea about uh, public speaking is, I call it the three B's of public speaking. Be simple, be brief, and be gone. <laughs> now let me tell you where I learned that. I was 31 years old. I was the youngest district attorney general in the state of Tennessee, and uh, when I was elected to office, and I was just full of myself. I wanted to go to every opportunity to talk to my constituents about law enforcement and crime and what I was going to do about it. And one night I was invited to speak at a group of law enforcement officials at the Lauderdale County High School in West Tennessee. And a young man met me about 6.30 in the evening, right before we had a big meal, and then I was the keynote speaker after the big meal. And uh, he was a young man, I guess he was 22, 23 years old. We'll call him Clarence. And Clarence said, I am your escort officer tonight. I'm gonna introduce you around. And he did. And it didn't take me long to figure out that Clarence was somewhat of a challenged young man. And he was so nice and so kind to me. And he went and he said, I want you to meet General Paul Summers, our district attorney general. And he introduced me to everybody he knew. And I appreciated it. So we had this big meal. 
And then I got to speaking about 9 o'clock at night. And I'm ashamed to tell you that I spoke for about an hour and 15, 20 minutes. And I told them everything they wanted to ever know about crime in Lauderdale County and about how I was going to do something about it and I was going to stomp it out. And here's how I was going to do it. And I, had, I didn't have PowerPoints. I just had all these points in my mind. Well, you know, ladies are real nice to you and they'll say things that they really don't mean, but they mean to make you feel good. So after I got through speaking about 10, 20 that night, all these ladies would come up and say, General Summers, we sure are glad you came out tonight. Mr. Summers, thank you for speaking. And Clarence was in that crowd. Clarence comes up to me and he says, General Summers, that's the longest, most dullish speech I have ever heard in my life. Well, one of those ladies right behind Clarence says, Oh, General Summers said, don't you pay any attention to Clarence. All he does is repeat what everybody else says. <laughs> so that's where I learned the three B's of public speaking. And that's what I'm going to do tonight. Now, I can't promise you about Clark Platt, but the thing about it is that you, when he finishes, you will want more. You will want to hear more. And so stay tuned for the future. Let me tell you a story about the Jason Foundation, Paul Summers and Clark Flat, and, and I'm kind of the warm up for introducing Clark. It all started, uh, actually it all started in July of 1997. July of 1997, Clark Flat and his wife Connie were living the American dream, lived up in Hendersonville, Tennessee. Clark was a very successful insurance man, had his own business, doing extremely well, had a great house, truck, car, SUV, four-wheeler, boat, Old Hickory Lake, boathouse, living the dream. Had two sons, one the older son, John, and the younger son, Jason. John was one of these academics. John could pick up things quickly. He didn't have to study too much. Uh, he now, by the way, John is now a, uh, a pediatric doctor. Actually, he's a pediat pediatric neurologist. It's hard for me to pronounce those. Down in Louisiana. Uh, Jason, great kid, great athlete. Uh, a, B student, sometimes C's, had a girlfriend, had a pickup truck, an old pickup truck, uh, living the dream. July 16th, uh, uh, 1997, Clark uh, got a phone call from uh, one of Jason's buddies, and it was uh, kind of an odd phone call, but it didn't mean anything, it wasn't negative. Basically, that one of his buddies said, have you heard from Jason today? Clark didn't think anything about it. He said, no, I hadn't. Well, he got to thinking about it, and something hit him. I guess you could call it the sixth, sixth sense of father's intuition, if you will. So at lunch, around lunchtime, Clark decided he'd go home, and he would, uh, he would figure out why Jason hadn't returned his, like then we didn't have cell phones, he had a beeper. And he didn't return the beeper call. Well, then Clark put in the, the super duper code that when you got it on your beeper, you called immediately. He didn't return that. Well, that kind of made Clark mad a little bit that Jason was ignoring it. But after all, he was only 16. So Clark goes home and uh, to his nice home in Hendersonville, and he sees Jason's vehicle out there in the driveway. Well, he knew that Jason was home. So what Clark intended to do was he intended to go up there and he figured, well, Jason's probably, uh, uh, he's probably listening to music on his, on his, uh, uh, with his earphones and he probably can't hear me. So he goes in and he says, he, sure enough, he comes in and uh, uh, he doesn't hear anything. So he goes upstairs and he figures Jason's in his room listening on his earphones. So what Clark was going to do, and he was going to come around the corner and scare Jason and maybe wrestle with him a little bit. 
and then they'd go sit out there on the tailgate of maybe Jason's truck and talk about whatever's going on. And he was also going to get on to him a little bit about not returning those people calls. Well, instead of being a father-son get-together, what happened was when Clark came around the corner, he stumbled over Jason's body and fell on Jason in the middle of the floor because Jason had taken Clark's 38 caliber pistol, put it to his head, and shot himself in the head. And at that time, Clark felt like it was surreal. It was like a movie. He actually thought that Jason was playing a trick on him, some kind of crazy Halloween trick or something. But then he realized that it was real. Well, needless to say, that was a life-altering event for the Flat family and for the Hendersonville community because they were so popular and so well-known. But I like to call what then was a terrible, terrible tragedy has now turned into, fast-forwarding to 2015, into a training triumph that we're about to explain to you. Because at that time, Clark, neither Clark Flat nor his family nor anybody else in Hendersonville, Tennessee for that matter, know anything about the warning signs of youth suicide because they didn't know what to look for. Now Clark, as we'll later tell you, that had he known then what he knows now, then maybe Jason would still be alive. Well. In 1999, I was, had the great honor to be the state attorney general uh, appointed by the Supreme Court in, 19, in January, and I was floating through the legislative plaza, and a mutual friend of ours introduced me to Clark Flatt. And we said and we had coffee, because our friend said, you need to know this man. Uh, you need to hear his story. And, of course, I said, well, sure, I'd like to. Well, I sat down and we had coffee there in March of 1999. And that one hour of coffee has built a friendship that's lasted now for 16, 16 years. And Clark is my dearest friend. But there was more of a reason, besides being the Attorney General of the state, thinking that this topic about youth suicide might help me in my capacity as Attorney General, maybe help others in the state of Tennessee, maybe save lives. There was a more self-serving reason that I wanted to hear more about Clark's story and about the Jason Foundation, and that was because my son Isaac was eight years old at the time, and I thought to myself when I had that coffee, this is something that I need to know about personally. Well. I want to share with you, and I've already started talking with you a little bit about how the Jason Foundation got started. Well, this is Jason. Uh, good looking kid, good athlete, good swimmer, good skier, A, B, sometimes C student, no warning sign. July 16, 1997, everybody's life changed. At that time, Jason became a statistic to what we call the silent epidemic of youth suicide. Let me ask you a question, and that is, if, if cable news came on Friday night, if network news came on Friday night and said the Centers for Disease Control has said that there is a silent epidemic that we don't know the origin for, and it comes, it comes about almost instantaneously, and we're losing 100 young people every week in America. And we don't know what to do about it. Do you think that America would be in an uproar about that issue? Do you think that America would be in an uproar about the issue of a silent epidemic where on the next Friday night it was reported on national news that 98 young people between the ages of 10 and 24 
lost their life to this epidemic. And then the following Friday night, it's reported that 102 lost their life and so on and so forth. Do you think that, that parents, that the teachers, that the caregivers of America might be in an uproar about that? We'll talk about that in a minute. Was it, it was a tragedy? No question. It was also a day for beginning because Clark told me in March of 99 that around about July, August, September <coughs> of 97 after Jason's death, he said, Paul, he said, and, and don't feel uncomfortable because he's heard me say this many times. He said, I had three options. After Jason, after I discovered Jason's body. Number one, I could have done the same thing that Jason did. Number two, I could become a drunk or an, or an alcoholic or a drug addict and check out. Or number three, I could go and educate myself and everybody I can come in contact with, whether they're parents, whether they're teachers, whether they're caregivers, about the warning signs of suicide that I didn't know anything about. To prevent this from happening to somebody else. He chose the last option. Fortunately for us. Uh, now what began in the copy room of Clark Flats insurance business in Hendersonville, Tennessee. Now we have a headquarters in Hendersonville, 73 affiliate offices in 24 states. We have a presence in all the states we educate one-on-one -on -one over a million people a year. Last year alone, we educated over 150,000 teachers in, of two hours of continuing education in America about the warning signs of youth suicide. And oh, by the way, we don't charge for our programs. The Jason Foundation is dedicated to the prevention of the silent epidemic of youth suicide through educational and awareness. We're not clinical. Programs that equip young people, educators, youth workers, and parents with the tools to assist at-risk youth. We have affiliates. We're proud of our affiliates. Without our affiliates, we could not operate. In 2004, uh, when I was uh, uh, the Attorney General of Tennessee, I was also a member of the National Association of Attorneys General. The acronym is NAG, N-A-A-G. In 2004, uh, I was able to get President Clark Flatt a speaking engagement in Washington before all 50 Attorneys General. He gave his captivating speech one of my friend, Attorney General, the former Attorney General of one of the states in the West, he got up abruptly before Clark got through speaking and almost ran out of the room. It was very noticeable because he was a former college football player. He weighed about 280 pounds and was about 6'6". So everybody kind of noticed and thought it was kind of odd. He later apologized to me as his, he was checking out of the hotel to go back to his home in Arizona. He said, Paul, he said, you tell your friend Clark Flatt that uh, I apologize for leaving, for leaving the room, but I realized after he got to speaking that I have a terrible problem at my own home, and I called my wife and I called my daughter. Uh, that man later wound up being on the board of directors of the Jason Foundation, and his daughter is doing well today. They, uh, some of our, our national spokesperson, Philip Fulmer, a name most of you probably are familiar with. Philip does more for us now than he did when he was the coach at the University of Tennessee. Uh, uh, not, only, not only does he get around all around the United States actually as our spokesperson, but he also, with this fellow, uh, heads up our uh, celebrity, we call it our celebrity uh, annual uh, Jason Foundation Charity Golf Tournament, which, by the way, is coming up, uh, coming up next month, May the nineteenth. Uh, we it's so popular that we fill up with, with 
two golf courses, eight, eight, 18 times two. It's unbelievable. Anyway, uh, Charlie Daniels is one of our affiliates. He's one of our, he's one of our celebrity spokespersons. Also, some select celebrity spokespersons are Rascal Flats. Uh, they do a tremendous job for us. They make PSAs for us, public service announcements, uh, and uh, have cut several songs for us. Uh, our, uh, some of our community affiliates, our national community affiliates, are Acadia, Ardent, HCA, uh, E4 Health, Springtone, Springstone, and may I announce the other one? Signature Health. Uh, these are primarily the folks who help us maintain our programs, help us maintain our programs at no cost. We also have uh, other community affiliates, such as the Attorneys General State Programs. We've got over 40 of the Attorneys General around the United States that are, or our ambassadors. So when we come into their, their states, they are able to give us an audience, they are able to give us appointments with their, their various officials. Uh, We've got the American Football Coaches Association, the American Football League, and the National Association of School Resource Officers as our national community affiliates. Some of our regional local affiliates, and you'll recognize some, look at the very one on the bottom, law enforcement agencies, corporate, private sector, community and professional organizations, mental health associations, and crisis intervention services. Let's talk just a minute about the silent epidemic. <coughs> the first step, be aware. Awareness is the first step. The prevention of suicide has not been adequately addressed due to basically a lack of awareness. The same lack of awareness that we had back in 1997 still exists today, but that's why we're here right now, is to make everybody aware. Uh, 1999 is when we really got a boost, when the Surgeon General of the United States, Dr. David Satcher, declared suicide a national health problem, especially with young people and elderly populations. Suicide, the second leading cause or manner of death for youth ages 12 to 18. That's middle and high school ages in America. The second leading cause or manner of death for college age youth 18 to 22 in America. The second leading cause of death for youth ages 10 to 24 in America. 10 to 24. That's why when my son Isaac was 8, that's why I said, I need to know something about this. It, you, you can never be too young to know something about this silent epidemic. If you add up all of these other causes of death, cancer, heart disease, pneumonia, stroke, so on and so forth, combined, more teenagers die from suicide than those other causes of death combined. We are losing an average of 100 young people per week because of this silent epidemic. Let's look at some facts. Let's look at some warning signs and what we can do to prevent this tragedy. But right now I would like to introduce my best friend, the president of the Jason Foundation, who fortunately for all of us not only in Williamson County, but also all over the United States, chose that third alternative, and that is to try to educate and train people on the warning signs of youth suicide. My dear friend, Clark Flat. Thank you. I walk around more than he does, so uh, I'm just glad to be here tonight and, and talk to you. We're going to. Uh, Paul is the nice part. He does the part of talking about the Jason Foundation. But we're here about the, about the silent epidemic of youth suicide. And what we'll be sharing now are some of the warning signs, uh, elevated risk factors, some things that will uh, help you. As I was talking at the very beginning, if, if we do nothing else tonight but raise the awareness that we're successful 
as, as Paul showed the uh, one slide, the World Health Organization, said really basically the base root reason that we're not doing more about it is that we're not aware of the problem. We're not aware of how it's affecting our communities until unfortunately we have one of those suicides or suicide attempts that are high profile. So we're gonna talk about it. Few suicide rates in the past 40 years have more than tripled while remaining rel relatively the same for all other age populations except for the elderly. And the elderly has also seen almost a corresponding rise in suicide rates as the young people. Let's look at some facts about it and how it applies to our population. Girls attempt suicide three times more often than boys. And you see the question underneath, why? Uh, you know, most of the time when, when Paul hadn't put the time limit on me and I, I want to go around the crowd and I ask, I, why, do you, why do girls attempt at a rate three times more often than boys? But I'm going to cheat and give you the answer tonight. You know, when I would go around the room, a lot of people would say, well, they're more in tune with their feelings, they're more emotional. There's a lot of different reasons that's given, and probably there's some truth to all of those reasons. But the real reason why I'm cheating and giving you the answer, we don't know. Clinically, we have no understanding of why girls attempt at a rate three times more often than boys. However, we know that's a factual happening in our community today. Boys complete suicide at a rate four times that of girls, though. Now, let's remember, as Paul brought up the slide, how many young people are we losing per week to suicide? 100. Girls are attempting at a rate three times higher than boys. However, boys are completing at a rate four times higher than girls. The reason for the difference, this one we do know. The choice of means, choice of lethality. Girls have historically chosen uh, drugs as a means of, of a suicide attempt. Drugs many times will give you a window of opportunity, uh, whether it be hours, sometimes as late as the next day, depends on the drug, depends on the amount of drugs. But this choice of lethality many times will give you a time to intervene for girls. Boys have historically chosen firearms, and that very seldom gives you a second opportunity, gives you a chance to intervene. So the choice of lethality is why girls have a much higher attempt ratio, but boys have a much higher uh, completion. And I hate the word completion, but that's uh, just the way of saying the, that the suicide attempt uh, did cause a victim of, of suicide. But there is a recent trend. Uh, SAMHSA calls it a recent trend, the U.S. Department of Health calls it a recent trend. We saw it as early as 2001. In 2001, we saw a, a, the choice of means starting to change with our girls. Uh, choice of means, they, they went from uh, using drugs to uh, suffocation, uh, more precisely hanging. Uh, this change went away from the choice of lethality to a much higher risk factor with suffocation. Therefore, we started seeing that, that not being just attempters, but regrettably they were victims now of a suicide attempt. Uh, the suicide rates started growing. In fact, three years ago, we had the highest uh, rate of suicide increase than we had in 15 years. It was all because of one age group, because of one gender and one method. Uh, the age group was 10 to 19. Uh, the gender, of course, were females. And the number one uh, cause, the number one reason uh, was suffocation or hanging. If that uh, continues, uh, you can see what that's going to do. When girls are attempting at a rate three times higher than boys, what happens when they're no longer attempters, but they now become victims of suicide? That rate, even if all the statistics that we'll be looking at in a minute stays the same, the number of deaths are going to rise significantly. And that's what we're seeing today uh, in our nation. Not only do we want to watch out for the boys and the girls, but the girls now are really starting to affect that rate of, of suicides within our nation. We're going to look at something now that if you haven't used, and it, this is not just on suicide. It's called the Youth Risk Behavioral Survey, uh, the YRBS. It's done by the Center for Disease Control. It's also done in 42 states, and it's done in cooperation with the Department of Health, Department of Education, Department of Mental Health. It varies from state to state. If you don't know about this and you work with young people, you need to look it up. You can just put down, it's done every two years. The last one was 2013. The 2013 Youth Risk Behavioral Survey, the CDC, has a lot of information about anything from drugs to alcohol to dating violence to all kinds of things that affects young people's lives today. 
very good uh, information for those that work with young people. But they also have four questions that deal with, with youth suicide, and that's what we're going to look at here tonight. The four questions we look at, you'll see Tennessee listed, and then in the one in parentheses will be the national rate. Now, if you're at or just a little below that, you don't need to get excited and say, yay, we're below that national rate or right at the national rate, because the national rate is the second leading cause of death in our nation. Also, the, the rate that causes 100 plus suicides per week in our nation. So keep that in mind as we look at the stats. The first question is, have you felt sad or hopeless every day in a row for a period of greater than two weeks so it affected your usual activities? That's the longest question. What's that a question for? I heard it over here whisper even, depression. Not only depression, but it can be uh, considered the definition of what we call clinical depression. That thing that you just don't pull yourself up by the bootstraps, uh, and, you know, hit yourself on the chin and say, get tough, you know, you can work your way through it. A lot of times with depression, especially clinical depression, it takes professional help, it takes a counselor, sometimes even medication on that. Here in t Tennessee, 28.3% of our young people, a little over one out of every four, said they had felt this way, not in their lifetime, but in the previous 12 months here in Tennessee, compared to 29.9 national. Depression is one of the leading causes of suicide attempts and suicides in our nation today. When you have this at this percentage, you're going to have issues. You're going to have problems within your state. Over a little over one out of every four of our young people. These are not young people in California, New York, or Florida. These are our own young people to answer these. The second question, have you seriously considered suicide in the past 12 months? In Tennessee, 15.2%. Over one out of every seven students got to a point in their life in the past 12 months that they would report that they seriously sat down and thought about suicide in their life as a response to something that happened, as a response to how they were feeling in life. No matter what the issue is, we have to say that that's a number that we have to say really affects us when we look at our young people around. When you go home and look across the, the table and you see the young people that are there, one out of every seven got to a point where they seriously considered suicide. Well, you might say, well, Clark, that's a high number. And, and uh, first of all, remember, that's not the Jason Foundation. That's the CDC and our own Department of Education. But also you say, when they say seriously considered, something happened in that young person's life that was traumatic for them. And they might report that, yes, I considered suicide. When you and I know that those were little fleeting moments and something they would get through. And it's probably when they answered that was just thinking about the impact that was at that very moment. And you're probably right if you had that. That's why we have the third question. The third question is, have you made a plan on how to commit suicide in the past 12 months? In Tennessee, 13.5%. Almost one out of every seven got to a point where they sat down and they planned the how, when, and where. Now, why this is an important question for us, whether we're adults or whether we're young people ourselves dealing with our friends, is that someone who has made a, a plan has gone from a time of concern to a time of crisis. Uh, if you're a counselor or have anything to do with counseling, you know that if you're talking with someone that you think might be uh, thinking about hurting themselves, somewhere in that early conversation, you're going to say, you're going to ask that question, gee, have you thought about how you would do it? If they can tell you how, when, and where, as we said, you've gone from a time of concern to a time of crisis because a suicide attempt is almost certain to happen at this point. Of course, the last question, have you attempted suicide one or more times? in the past 12 months. In Tennessee, we're a little higher than the national norm. We're at 9%. Almost one out of every 11 kids in our state answered that they had attempted suicide. Now, it's important at this point not to normalize or say that it's something that every young person is doing. When you say one out of 11, that's certainly not acceptable. But also, you've got to see that 10 out of 11 didn't. That 10 out of 11 didn't attempt. That 10 out of 11 handled those issues, handled those things in their life, and did not attempt suicide. So that's the positive part. That's the part we have to look at and say, not everybody's doing it. But still, when you say 9%, one out of 11 uh, got to the point where they attempted, it's still an unacceptable. One is too many. When you take those statistics and you put it to our school population, which I like to do, statistics are, uh, percentages are sort of hard to think about. What we can say, if nothing is done differently in our state, what can we project for the next 12 months? Beginning depression, we'll have a little over 123,000 students that will get to that point. 
We'll have 66,000 that will seriously consider suicide out of that 58,000 young people will get to a point where they'll actually plan their own suicide. And out of that number, that 39,000 or average here in Tennessee of about 108 per day uh, that will get to the point where they would report having attempted suicide. But what can be done, Clark? You might be saying, well, Clark, they, we, Paul's told us all about the Jason Foundation, brought us up in the second leading cause of death, only surpassed by unintentional injuries. Now you've shared that one out of every 11 young people here in our own state have attempted suicide. That is something that we are faced with as a silent epidemic in our state. But what can be done? Youth suicide is impulsive, isn't it? You know, this is a myth that we like to hold on to as, as parents, as teachers, as communities. If we hold on to this myth, it does something for us. It relieves us of responsibility. If we say there's nothing we can do about it because something happened in that young person's life and all at once they went from everything being great to, to gloom and despair and, and attempting suicide, then we feel like there's nothing we can do because we can't be with young people 24-7. So we think of it as that myth of being an impulsive act. Two major studies have been done. Both studies came out with exactly the same report. Four out of every five young people who will attempt suicide will demonstrate clear warning signs before the attempt. Four out of every five. Now there is that one out of five is impulsive. That one that will be that, that impulsiveness that something happened that day that caused it. But four out of five will give clear warning signs before that attempt. That means in 80% of those attempts, if we know what to look for and how to respond, whether we're parents, whether we're teachers, whether we're young people that's trying to deal and help our own friends, 80% of the time, if we know what to look for and how to respond, we have a chance on making a difference. Our first action has to be to increase awareness, as Paul said. You can't do anything about a problem unless you know it's a problem. This is not to, to hype it up tonight. It's not to say it's something that everyone's doing. But it is saying that, that, that suicide, especially youth suicide, is a national public health issue. As Dr. David Satcher said in 1999, and still is today. Step two has to be education, though. You just can't be aware. What would, he, what would we say about intervening? We have to know what to look for, and then how to respond appropriately. Tonight, we're going to hit these very, very quickly because, uh, as Paul said, we're trying not to go the whole time and the whole night. Our, our training seminars are two hours in length, so this is not that. Don't get nervous. We're not in our two-hour seminar tonight. Uh, but I do want to expose you to those warning signs and the elevated risk factors so that you can leave here tonight with an understanding of those. First of all, in education, we have to do several things, dispelling the myths, learning warning signs, elevated risk groups, and then the last one of building action plans. Let's go through these very quickly tonight. Dispelling myths. These are the first thing that we have to do when we start our education. The first one is the myth that talking to someone about suicide will put the, the notion, to put the idea in their head. Just the opposite has been proven. If someone is considering, someone is thinking about it, by you talking to them in an educational, professional way will only help that young person. Will only help that young person know that there's someone there who cares about them and who wants to help them with the issue that they're facing. By talking about it, we don't put the notion in their head. Someone, the next myth is someone who talks about suicide is not at risk. You ever heard that said? Oh, if they're telling you they're thinking about it, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, that's something that, that uh, uh, if they're talking about, they're just trying to get attention. Well, they're right on one thing. If they're talking about it, they are get, trying to get attention. They're trying to let somebody know that they're hurting, that they need someone to help them and support them in addressing those issues. And that the last one, of course, suicide is impulsive and there's nothing we can do about it. We just talked about that. Four out of every five young people who will attempt suicide will give clear clinical warning signs. We just have to know what to look for. The signs of concern. Now you notice I've changed this. Most people call these warning signs. I don't like to call them warning signs. I like to call them signs of concern. Why do I differentiate between the two? A warning sign says if you see this, then this is more than likely this other action is liable to happen or going to happen. Uh, a lot of the warning signs that people talk about in youth suicide are really also some of the same signs of adolescence. 
you know, it doesn't say that when you see this, then, then automatically suicide or a suicide attempt it is a for sure thing. I like to call them signs of concern because if you see these things going on in a young person's life, whether it's your child or your student or your friend, if you see these things going on, it means there's something going on that should concern you, that you should ask questions about, that you should probe with the young person that, hey, I'm seeing some things that bring me concern. And, and that's why we like to call them the, the, the uh, signs of concern instead of warning signs. And remember, we have to admit that a lot of these are the normal signs of adolescence. Unless they persist over a long period of time, the real key is seeing more than one present at the same time in a young person's life. And the behavior is what we call out of character for how you know that young person. These are the kind of signs of concern. Let's go through them real quick. The suicide threats, previous suicide attempts, the depression, out of character behavior, and final arrangements. Let's talk about them briefly. Suicide threats can be as obvious as a young person saying, I'm going to kill myself. You'd be amazed at how many times that happens. You're talking about the calls that you've had. Somebody reaching out and saying, I'm at that point. We have to take those seriously. I can't tell you how many times that we've been brought in on a, an event that happened and we find out that several people, this individual has told what they were going to do. In my own son's case, he, t he called two people the morning that he committed suicide, told both of his friends what he was going to do, when he was going to do it, and how he was going to do it, and they called no one. Not because they were bad kids, not because they were bad friends even. It's, as we call it down here in the South, the deer in the headlight. You know, they froze. It, they didn't know how to respond. And by not knowing how to respond and not how to take that seriously, it ended up then costing Jason his life. We have to take those, those direct threats, but also sometimes those that things are not so direct. A young person saying something like, gee, you know, nobody would miss me if I wasn't here. Nobody cares about me. I'm not really making a difference in anybody's life. All those things like that can be taken as a suicide threat. And we have to take those seriously. Previous suicide attempts, wow. You'd think that would be obvious, but you'd be amazed how many times that those people who work with young people miss those things. Someone who's already attempted suicide once or twice prior to this, and, and we, we are not working with that young person. We're not trying to help them. Uh, there's a lot of times we've come in, and, and especially with teachers, we've learned that they have learned about a previous suicide attempt. They have brought the young person in. They've talked with them. The young person says, whoa, wait a minute. I, I didn't mean that. That I was just, really, it was just a, a one moment in time if you tell them, if you tell the principal uh, they're going to get my mom and dad involved and I promise I will never do that again if you'll keep it quiet and the teacher says all right we're making a pact I, I won't tell anybody if you promise me you won't do it again and they say I promise the next thing we know there's been a suicide attempt or a, a regrettably a tragic suicide never keep a previous suicide attempt whether you're a, a parent whether you're a teacher or whether you're a, a young person yourself, that if you know of someone who's attempted, you make sure you tell a responsible adult. You make sure you get a professional involved and you address that immediately because this is a tremendous warning sign for another attempt to come up. Depression, depression is a tough one to do. Depression, some people who are depressed, uh, they eat everything that doesn't get out of their reach fast enough. Other people who are depressed don't eat at all. Uh, some people who are depressed uh, sleep all the time. Other people who are depressed don't sleep. So depression is a tough one. It's tricky. That's why we tied into number four, out-of-character behavior. If you know someone that's out acting out-of-character for the way you know him or her, whether it be your student or whether your child or your friend, somebody that's very loud and outgoing becomes very quiet. Somebody very quiet becomes very outgoing. Somebody who loves sports all at once loses interest in it. Somebody who loves to shop all the time now never wants to go out and shop. Anything that's out of character for that friend that you know or that young person you know has to be taken seriously. Does it mean that they're suicidal? No. It might mean they're just changing in life. But if you've noticed it, then if you owe it to yourself, you owe it to your friend, you owe it to your student or your child to ask. I'm seeing some things that are different. I'm seeing some things that concern me. And I want to know, is there something going on in your life we need to deal with, that you need help with, that's something that we can work together on? Out-of-character behavior is a big indicator. And the last one is final arrangements. 
it used to be years ago, we've been doing this almost 18 years now. Years ago, it used to be only our, our females who would do this as far as final arrangements, giving away prized possessions. Uh, but now we've had more, it's going to where it's for both male and female. Uh, we always work, especially when we work with our young people, we talk about the, the final rank of giving away something. If a friend gives you a prized possession, make sure you ask your friend why they're giving it to you. You know, it might be that they just want to give you a great gift, and, and that happens a lot, and that's wonderful. You can thank your friend for it. But always make sure you ask that friend. And we tell our parents, if your son or daughter comes home with a prized possession, the first thing you need to do is ask your son or daughter, gee, that's wonderful. I didn't know, I, that's a tremendous gift that your friend gave you. Did you ask them why? If they didn't, you say, hey, how about get on your cell phone, get on the phone, call your friend, thank him or her again for this wonderful gift that they gave you today, and then just simply ask them, oh, by the way, I just need to ask you, why did you give me this great gift today? Why did you do it? You'd be amazed at the time that the answer is, well, because I didn't need it anymore, and I wanted you to have it. It saved a tremendous amount of lives just asking that simple question. Why did you give it to me today? The, the final arrangements, giving away prized possessions. Again, one of the signs of concern for suicide. Elevated risk factors are tough ones. Uh, they're tough because they're, they're also direct attention away from the main group that we're losing today. Most people who think about young people who would attempt suicide categorize them in one of these groups. And, and it is because within those groups, they are higher than average. They are increased risk factors in those groups. However, still the number one young person we're losing in America today is that better than average student, the better than average kid, the one that's really, you look at and says, has everything to live for, all the potential that's there, that's the number one. But still there are elevated risk groups we have to look at. These, we don't have time to go into every one of them, but I wanted you to see these. All these are also available on our website uh, that you can go on, and we have the brochures back there that goes into more detail. But there's several up there that I'd like to just to bring one or two to perfectionists. Gee, and you don't have to raise your hand. Do you ever have a, a son or daughter or a friend that you know that has to be number one all the time, that has to be the A student, chosen first within the, within the athletics and things? Uh, the perfectionist, does it mean you tell them not to be perfectionist? No, but you say that you just realize that in that age group is a higher than average uh, risk group. Uh, changes in school status, uh, abusers of drugs or alcohol, any of those types of issues right there are higher than average elevated risk factors for our young people. The basic rule to remember, if you ever have a concern about a young person or a friend, you get professional help. You always reach out to that friend. You always reach out and get professional help immediately. Remember those 100 young people we lose each week to suicide? 80 of them shouldn't have died. That's the four out of five, 80%. Four out of five, 80% shouldn't have died. So with that 100 that we're losing every week, 80 of them gave warning signs, signs of concern uh, that we should have noticed as friends, as, as teachers, as pastors, people that we should have identified and got their help. If we had trained their friends, their educators, those people shouldn't have died. Step three is the resources, and I wanna go through some of those. These are the Jason Foundations, but also there's a lot of good organizations. You, you see something from the AFSP back there. They're a great organization. The crisis, the CIT teams that you have across the country. These are all people that are resources for our communities that we need to access. And they must be for all three segments of a community. As we go out and talk about suicide awareness and prevention, you have to have programs for the young people themselves. They see the changes in their friends way before anybody else. Not to make them counselors now, but to give them the, the tools to be able to recognize a friend who is struggling and then know how to respond by getting appropriate help. Also by educators and parents themselves. Real quickly, our programs, and, and these are all available on our websites, our uh, Promise for Tomorrow is our school-based program. It's for middle and high schools and the health and wellness curriculum. It, it addresses suicide in the third person. A young person is learning this to help a friend, and we do that on purpose, not to cause introspection, but to give you the tools and resources, first of all, to recognize a friend that might be struggling with suicidal ideation, 
But also when you learn that to help a friend, what do you also do? You learn how to help yourself many times. Uh, the B1 project by Rascal Flats that we do is, is a friend can make all the difference in the world, especially an informed friend, B1. And we ask people to go through a very short type of training thing on the website, a very positive peer support program. Our in-service for training to the teachers that Paul talked about uh, is our number one program. It's our training for educators where we provide the in-service training for teachers. I truly believe, as I get to go around the country, the number one thing a state can do in addressing suicide is to train their educators. If you train your educators to recognize the warning signs and know how to respond with their own school protocol, uh, you will save lives. There's no doubt about it. And of course, our parent seminars uh, and our community overviews as we're doing here tonight. Here's something that we have some you know, cards in the back. And if you haven't done this, it, we did this for young people. However, it's, it's good for anybody who works with young people or anybody who has kids. It's called a friend app. It's a smartphone app. You can download it. It has all the warning signs, the resources, how to help a friend, the do's and don'ts. Uh, it is a tremendous app that you can have there. We found that a lot of people, when you go through a seminar, it's hard to remember those warning signs. It's hard to remember the do's and don'ts uh, six months from now. So this is something you can have on your smartphone. We have a lot of, of, of young people download this in their school so that they have it as close as their smartphone if they see a friend that's having issues. Plus, you'll see the Get Help Now button. If you push that anywhere in the country, you'll get connected to the closest uh, national crisis uh, suicide prevention hotline that's certified by uh, the, the uh, SAMHSA and the uh, uh, SPRC. So this is a free app. Uh, it's something that uh, we hope that you will think about downloading for yourself and also sharing uh, to the young people you might know. And our staff development, as we said, is our in service for training. I would say about, uh, uh, well, let me go right here. Well, nope, I'm going to throw this in here. Uh, on our staff development, we had the, uh, called the, the Jason Flat Act, named after my son. Tennessee was the first state to pass it. It's home cooking. Uh, we passed it in 2007. What it required was every teacher in the state of Tennessee to have two hours of youth suicide awareness and prevention training. Didn't have to be the Jason Foundation. It'd be anybody that's approved by the Department of Education. Since that time, we've had now 14 other states pass that law. 15 states have the Jason Flat Act. I just passed in Georgia and Montana uh, this month. So this is something that's really arming our, our educators with the information, tools, and resources they need to help prevent this silent epidemic of youth suicide. As Paul said also, one of the unique things about us is we started in 97, we said we would never charge for any of our programs, whether it be our in-service training for teachers, our school programs, whatever we did out there, we wouldn't charge. We didn't want money to be an issue. In 1997, that wasn't too hard. Uh, we had maybe two or 300 people utilize some of our programs. Uh, last year, 1.2 million people went through one or more of our programs. So that's getting to be a tremendous more challenge to us. But because of some really great people and some of those affiliates that Paul shared with you, uh, we're still able to meet that. And that's something we're very dedicated to. We don't want the lack of funding to ever be an issue for a school or a church or a community group that's wanting to do something about this silent epidemic. I'd like to invite you to visit us on the web. Uh, it's uh, jasonfoundation.com. You'll find out a lot more information about us, but tonight we wanted to be brief so that we could also uh, have a time for any questions and hopefully answers for you uh, at the end of this. And our theme is keeping more than dreams alive one young person at a time. That's a picture of my buddy Jason. That was taken about two months before we lost him uh, to the silent epidemic of youth suicide. Our corporate office in Hendersonville, Tennessee, as we say down south, uh, y'all come see us if you're in this area. Be glad to have you visit us there. I end with this. Uh, and this is where I step out from being the president of JFI to a parent. And I'm, I'm, we had some young people here probably had to get out and get back to their uh, place before a certain time and uh, glad they were here to learn some tools to, to learn about watching after a friend uh, is something that we we really see the difference with young people learn. but I want to talk to the parents and the grandparents that are in the in the audience right now and I want to talk to you as a parent if nothing else I'm going to give you something to take back to the, tonight that will change the relationship between you and your child I promise you I'm, I'm so sold on this idea that if it doesn't, I will double what you paid to come and attend this tonight. 
That's a pretty easy guarantee, isn't it? It's called Project Hub. Now, first of all, you can't do it tonight, especially if your kids know that you went to a suicide prevention seminar. They're waiting for you to come back and try all your newfound knowledge upon them. And so they will be watching for you. You've got to wait a couple of weeks. After a couple of weeks, and, and also you got to make sure your kids are there. It doesn't work very well either. You go home one day and you sit in front of your TV. When you get in front of the TV, get down on the ground and cross your legs. Take your remote. Make sure the TV is off and you're just facing the TV with a remote in your hand looking at a blank screen. Your son and daughter will go by you. And when they go by you, they will look down and notice you're watching a blank TV. Now, they might even go by once or twice, but I guarantee you they will not be able to resist the temptation to come back and say, Mom, Dad, are you feeling okay? Is everything okay? Now, this is the fun part. And we all like to be mean to our kids. I always have people look funny at me when I say that. I don't mean hurt them. We like to just, they get us so many times, we like to get them back a little bit. This is something that you can be mean, but yet the best thing you've ever done too. When they ask you, is everything all right? Just lean over in front of you, pat the ground, and say, would you sit down for a minute? There's something I want to talk to you about. Everything they've done in the last year that they think you don't know about, will go in front of their, their mind at that point. We've even had some heartfelt confessions at that point. I was going to tell you, Mom, about that. Uh, but then as they sit there, just smile at them. Don't say a word. Try that to somebody at work. You just look at them and smile. And not, people start breaking out in sweats. You know. Then after you had enough fun, this is the important part that will change your relationship with your son or daughter. Look at them and say, you know, I get so wrapped up in my own problems. I get so wrapped up in today's pressures. You know, I'm worried about the economy, my job, the insurance, the house note, the car note, the mechanics bill, all these things that are on me. And I get so wrapped up in my own problems, I'm afraid that I don't take enough time to tell you how much I love you, how much you mean to me, and how my world revolves around you. And I just want to take this minute right now to tell you, I love you, and you're my world. And I don't care if they're a six foot five, 230 pound tackle, you lean over and kiss them on the forehead and say, and I just want to take that time to tell you, I love you. And then get up and walk away. It'll destroy them. But also they'll, they'll remember, I call it the, the reflex of love. You know, what's a reflex? A reflex is something you build up over time. If you do this just one time, it's hokey. You know, it will impress them. But they'll say, hey, mom and dad was having a bad day and they had to tell me that. You've got to build that reflex of love. And how you do that is by doing it over and over. As, as Paul said, my oldest son now, uh, he's, he's 38 years old. Pediatric neurologist, smart guy. His own practice. Whether I go to his house in Louisiana or he comes to my house, I, we only see each other about every quarter, every three months or so. I pull this on him at least once. Now when he sees me sitting in front of the TV, I hear him start to laugh. And he comes and he hits me at shoulder length and puts me on the ground and straddles me. He starts hitting me in the chest easy and saying, I love you too, Dad. I love you too. You know, what we've done is we've built that reflex of love. You know, because I don't care who your son or daughter is, how great a family you have. There's going to be a time in his or her life when the world as they see it is going to crush, crumble down around their ears, at least the way they perceive it. If they have to think mom and dad loves me, you got a chance of a real serious problem happening. But if they have that reflex, without even thinking about it, I know mom will understand, I know dad will understand, I know they love me unconditionally, then it could just be a life-saving event. You see, Jason knew I loved him. There's no doubt about that. I put the roof over his head, food on his table, sent him to school, gave him a car when he got 16. He knew I loved it, but it wasn't a love reflex. So that when things came crushing down around his head, it wasn't the, just a natural thing to say, mom or dad can help me. Mom and dad will understand. You know, the reflex of love. If you try a project hug and we'll do it, you don't have to do it every week. Just do it every once in a while. You'll see a great response to your children 
than one that you might not have ever seen before. Project Hub, it's, it's worth its weight in gold. Well, I'm going to end right here on Project Hub and tonight because we want to be able to give some time to, uh, and we said an hour, we're right on it, Paul. We're doing good. But I want to give some time, a few minutes, five or ten minutes, to answer some questions. If I don't know the answer, or if Paul doesn't know the answer, we'll, we'll just tell you we don't know. And if you'll give me your name and something, if there's an answer out there to be found, we'll try to find it. But I do want to appreciate the, the People's Church here and the people and the law enforcement that helped us come here tonight and provide some of the information, tools, and resources. A very quick crash course in, in youth suicide awareness and prevention. But hopefully it'll give you some information that you'll be useful, some things that will at least cause some thought process, and that these other programs like our parent seminar that you can get, have in your church, is a two-hour program any way you cut it. But if you really want to have an in-depth type of study, these are the types of programs, whether the Jason Foundation or somebody else's. If you look at ours and say, that's not what we're looking for, let me know. I know about almost every major program that's out there, and I don't care whose name is on it. We want to get you the information and the tools and the resources that will help you uh, with whatever situation or whatever opportunity you have for youth suicide awareness and prevention. So if we've got about five or ten minutes, so I'm going to open it up with, for any questions that you might have. And it can be personal. Uh, there's not any question that's, that's off limit. Yes? Do you have any statistics surrounding adopted children? Adopted children. What we have found out is that uh, and this will help you on the foster children. It might be the situation. We haven't seen too much just on adopted. Uh, we are now getting involved with DCS, not only here in Tennessee, but in several other states, because they brought it to us that, that through the foster children, that there's a higher than average, uh, they would fall within an elevated risk group. Uh, probably because of the challenges of being detached. I haven't seen any hard clinical data on that, but I would think because of what we've heard from DCS is, uh, working with foster that, that adopted children could very much have an elevated risk factor. I wouldn't think that it would be dramatic though, uh, especially if they found a family that is loving. That's the whole thing. It's not the biological parent. It's someone that, that you feel tr that you can trust and that loves you and cares about you. I think that's the, the only difference thing would be there. The foster child who's going from home to home to home sometimes we find uh, doesn't have that attachment or that groundedness sometimes, which can cause some issues. Yes? I do have a question about, um, you were saying like when you see these signs of concern that you would get professional help. So all the time we're hearing kids that are, have been under professional help, whether it be a psychologist or counselor, who have committed suicide. Mm -hmm. so like what statistics do you have to show that that helps in any way? Oh, well, yeah, that's a good question. What she said is that, you know, we're saying get a responsible adult uh, in, involved. Uh, and first of all, let me say two things. Everybody who calls himself a counselor or even a psychiatrist is not good possibly with suicidal ideation. That's something that, that is unique. And that's something, and even when I tell, talk to a parent who's getting help for their son or daughter on a professional basis, I always say, listen to your son or daughter. If they're not connecting, if they say they're not connecting with that therapist, very well, not, the therapist could be a great person. They're just not connecting. You get another doctor involved because you've got to have one that your son or daughter buys into. Now the difference of that, the therapist who is good at that, who's connecting with your uh, son or daughter or a young person, uh, the, the odds of survival there greatly increase than someone who, who, who just tries to tough it through. Uh, and I'm a big uh, 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 a proponent of also medication. Uh, when the, uh, they put the warning label on uh, the antidepressants for kids, I testified against it. Uh, because I, said, I know kids are alive today because they were able to take medication that got them through that very, very high, intensely painful time in order to have the counseling and therapist. You take away that drug. Now, it was misused. A lot of, there's a lot of pediatricians that gave that very, very openly, very easily, without any counseling. You should never give, I feel like in my opinion, you should never give the antidepressant to a young person without counseling being involved too by, by a professional. It just shouldn't happen. When it came off, when the, when the label came on in 2008 and they said, hey, this can cause suicidal ideation, it was based on a study in the United Kingdom. Not a single young person had committed suicide because they were on that drug. However, there had been an increase in suicidal ideation thinking. And so that's what got the black box. 2009, we had one of the largest single increases in youth, well, 2010, uh, single increases in youth suicide that we've had. 
And I really believe it's because there was a kickback in the, in the lack of medication. To say that the counseling, counseling is, is a no-brainer, you know, but it has to be with the right person. It has to be with the right person. And, and also, you've got to get professionals. Here I get in problems sometimes. I get to talk to, to groups of pastors, and I'm in a church now. Uh, um, I tell pastors, you can be an important part of the team that's helping a young person. Faith is a very big, big plus as far as a, a proactiveness of, of helping a young person. can be tremendous in it. However, do not try to, if a person is young person suicidal, do not be the only counselor unless you're a professional trained psychologist at least. Always get somebody else involved. Uh, in suicide, you only make a mistake once, and, and it can be tragic. But, but yes, there's no, no odds about it. It, it. The biggest problem we have is getting people to get the counseling uh, because you run into things. You don't realize that in Tennessee, if you're 16 years old, you cannot tell your son or daughter that has to go to a psychiatric facility. They have to, they have to sign a paper themselves unless you have them committed, unless you have a, uh, two psychiatrists say that. It's 16 years old, not 18, and several states are that way. Uh, so this is a problem, and we, I can't tell you a number of, of parents that call me that their son or daughter is 18 and 19 telling me what's going on, and they can't get the young person to go to counseling because of their age. Uh, it's something that, that's probably one of our biggest problems. Good question. Probably got time for about one more, maybe. Well, we got two, I'm gonna go with both of you. Go ahead. You're, teacher training in Tennessee. And our teacher training in Tennessee is required. It's mandated. Every year, uh, two hours. If they don't get it, they don't get, they're, they're not to be certified in the state of Tennessee, which means if you're not certified, you can't teach. Uh, now, and, and out of the 15 states, 13 have mandated it, and two have um, mandated it be, be offered. Uh, I've said twice, I will not let another state do it where they don't mandate it. If you don't mandate it, it's not. How would you like to have your son or daughter? There's three teachers, and one of them been trained, two of them's not, and your son or daughter's having issues, and they get with the teachers that hadn't been trained. You know, that's the issues. And so uh, I've said before, we will not let another state have it without uh, being mandated. I think that's the key. I think that's the key. Oh, over here, I'm sorry. Right, youth risk behavioral survey. The, are they anonymous? Yes. How do you know then who to help if they answer yes on oh. the question? The youth, yeah, youth risk behavioral survey is not to identify the young person in detail. Now the school and the school district many times are given that information, not as far as who they are, but, but it's just like you were talking about Williamson County. If you get these stats back and you compare them to the state, then you compare them to the national, if you've got a lot of young people saying that, that they have seriously considered or made a plan, it gives your, your teachers, it gives your communities a chance to know we have a higher than normal risk factor here. No, it would never be done with a person's name. That would, uh, that would uh, really go against a lot of laws real quick. Uh, but it is done by just, you can come back and tell a school what percentages they scored on in that, but not individuals. So the Youth Risk Behavioral Survey is not to point out people specifically who need help, but more that, that the, what type of issues are confronting your young people in your community. But a very good tool, it's a very good tool. Uh, that's where we hope the training to the teachers and the training to the young people uh, will help them uh, take serious. It, it would be like if those two that Jason called that morning, if they had gone through whether our training or somebody else's where they would say, aha, my friend has called me and told me that he's going to do this. I need to take that seriously because this is the second leading cause of death for our young people. I know that what he's told me is something that I need to get to a responsible adult. And they would have called either their own parents or somebody and told them, hey, I'm worried about my friend Jason. He said this. Very likely could have started a series of events that would save his life. Uh, so it, it's not as we say rocket science. It's very simple, basic things to learn. And it doesn't mean when you see those warning signs that they're basically suicide. We don't want an overreaction. You know, I got through one of these a parent seminar, which this is not our parent, a parent seminar goes two hours. 
Uh, I got through one of those several years ago and I had a parent come up to me and said, Clark, I'm going home and tying my kid to the bed. You know, he's not going to get out of my sight. He was scared because all these things, we talked about being the better than average student, the leader in the class, the football captain, all these things that were the average young person that were losing to suicide. He had, he had overreacted. That's my son. It's not to scare you and to tie your son or daughter to the bed, but make you more aware that these are real issues. It's not just something that happened to the flat family. It's something that happens, we said, too many times in our community, whether it be here in Franklin or whether it be to Tennessee or, or through our nation. Uh, it, is a, it, is a, it is a national, not mental health, but public health issue uh, in, our, in our nation today. I want to thank you for, for letting Paul and I come and, and, and share with you. We're going to be around for a few minutes after if there's another question that you'd have and you just didn't get it. But we want to be uh, conscious and, and uh, sensitive to your time here tonight. And when I saw we had an hour and a half, I said, unless Paul starts telling some jokes, we're going to get through early tonight. And, uh, but I do want to appreciate Paul's time. I want to appreciate our, uh, the law enforcement people that are here tonight uh, that do such a wonderful job in trying to help us with our young people in dealing with this terrible silent epidemic of use. So it's a tough job out there, and we want to appreciate it. We can save lives. That's the thing, though. We've got to learn. We've got to bring awareness, not to scare you, not to make you uh, emotionally hyped, but just to let you know that this is something that's happening. Uh, the, the stories that you read are riveting, you know, of, of the ones that have called in. That's the ones who made the call, not talking about the, the numbers that never made the call. So this is something that, that I please appreciate your community wanting to, to learn more about and how to address and how to prevent this terrible uh, silent epidemic called youth suicide. Uh, thank you again. I'll turn this back over to Judge. And, and uh, um, we, uh, we appreciate it. We'll be around for a few minutes if you'd like to talk and, or if you have any questions that we didn't get to uh, during this time. So thank you for letting us come. Once again, thank uh, Franklin Police for helping us out with this event, and thank you all for being here. I know that um, everyone is uh, touched by a suicide, either knows someone, a family member, relative, or a friend, and I suspect that that may be why a lot of you are here. And so we appreciate your spending your Tuesday night with us and hope that you've gained a little information. And many thanks to the Jason Foundation. and. Um, Judge Summers and Clark for sharing their story. So have a good evening and thank you all. Hello folks, I'm Bill Fitzgerald with Franklin Rodeo. The Franklin Noon Rotary Club is supporting Graceworks on Thursday, May 14th at the Franklin Rodeo. We're asking you to come out, bring your groups of 10 or more, get your tickets for $10. The Franklin Noon Rotary Club is proud to present Graceworks with a portion of the proceeds from this year's rodeo. So go on out, get your tickets at franklinrodeo.com and come and support Graceworks. It may come as no surprise that when the economy is in decline, fraud is on the rise. You have people who have been successful for the last 10 years, so they got a little something put away. Now, you know, they, they took their expense account, they cut their overtime, so now they're looking to increase their earning potential. Business opportunities can boom in a recession and in a, a downturn of the economy. Nobody in business is going to give you your money back if your business fails. You never saw me in your life. You saw a commercial on TV, you got on the phone with me, you spoke to me for 10 seconds, I gave you some names to call, and I gave you some things to look up, and you called me back three days later, and I, you wrote me a check for $50,000. Does that, does that sound a little screwed up? People want to believe that there is some opportunity that they can invest in that will guarantee that they will have financial success. There is no such thing. There just is no sure deal. 
None. The best advice I could give to anybody who's looking to purchase a business opportunity or purchase any investment over the phone is fast no's and slow yeses. Period, the end. Fast no's and slow yeses.